And now, the survival show that once survived, making one last episode. In this finale, this I2H finale, we discuss all sorts of things y'all may have wanted to know about the show, and even a little bit about me. And I'm the one in the hot seat this time, for a change. Howdy and welcome to the Rabbit Holes Urban Survival Podcast. This is episode number 300. I'm your host, Aaron, and you are in the rabbit hole. Safe? A few quick notes before we dive into this episode. First, there were a few technical glitches. Halfway through the video, it will switch to an odd angle. This was my backup camera. Don't usually use it, but this time I had to use it. The second was due to some internet issues. Is what it is. Last but not least, this is the final episode of I2H. In a nutshell, I2H will not release regularly scheduled podcast episodes anymore. The show will stay up on Apple, iTunes, and other players indefinitely. Have a listen to the episode titled WTF is happening to I2H for more information. There will be a link to it in the show notes on the site and in the description section on YouTube. Any new material will primarily focus on short YouTube videos. On the page for the WTF episode, is a way for you to join the I2H Inner Circle list. This is an email list and the best way to stay on top of anything new that happens with I2H going forward. With all that out of the way, let's welcome the real host of this episode on. Amanda, welcome back to In the Rabbit Hole. Thanks for having me back, Aaron. This is going to be a different twist since, of course, this is the finale for the podcast, but today you are the host of the show. So listeners understand, uh, you'll be asking the questions and I'll be answering whatever it is you ask. Yeah. So you're in the hot seat. Yes. <laughs> this could be really <laughs> different times, for me. How, yeah. How many times have you done this? Well, I, I've never done it on the rabbit hole. I've never been the guest on the rabbit Look, hole. I, um, but I mean, I've, I've been, and I've always tried to be, um, very considerate of other podcasters. Whenever I've gotten another podcaster asked me for an interview, I've I've done everything I could to accommodate and be on their show because I know how, especially new podcasters, it's scary to ask people to be on your show. Um, and even more seasoned podcasters, the uh, hunting and asking and emailing and tracking down and herding cats and getting people onto a show can be difficult. So. I guess for that, I always try to be very empathetic of, of other podcasters. And it's like, if they ask me, I almost always say yes, unless it's, unless it's something that I'm just like, I don't feel like this is going to be a good fit, which I think has only happened once or twice where I've just said, mm, I don't think so. Um, is, is it easier to be in the question E seat or the questioner seat? It's easier to be in the question E seat. It doesn't feel that way when you first start podcasting. Um, at first it's very nerve wracking because you have to be the one to come up with interesting, clever and creative questions while also not doing something dumb to piss off the guest. Um, but I think it's actually more difficult to be in the inter in the, the interviewee seat. It's more difficult to be concise with your words as the interviewee than it is with the person doing the interview. True. And you don't know what they're going to ask necessarily. So. Right. And you don't want to be like, oh, I'm going to look dumb because I'm going to sit there and be like, um, <laughs> I don't know. Let me think about that for you. And it's, you know, so it's, it's different, but it's, it's always fun. I enjoy both sides of the, both sides of the aisle. Well, I'll try to throw in a couple of questions that make you look dumb just for the heck of it. <laughs> I don't think I'll succeed, but anyway, well, but speaking of dumb, congrats on a, um, so completed semester uh, while working full time and podcasting full time. Yeah, just juggling a few balls. Thank you, thank you. It was it was interesting to go back. I think the the weirdest part of that is uh, the the age gap uh, between myself and and then the other people that I'm around and just having very different life perspectives and priorities and things like that. So, but it was it, it was challenging, but it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, well, it sounds like you you did it with flying colors. Yeah, and uh, it made it all look easy, so <laughs> that you know the rest of us feel like 
<laughs> I don't I don't know about that. I got uh, my wife definitely did not think I made it look easy. Well, she got to see the the freaked out Aaron. She got to see the Aaron who wakes up at three o'clock in the morning going, oh, my God, I missed a deadline, blah, 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 blah. And then I get a hand to the face and it, shut up and go back to sleep. You made an A on that. Um, it's already done. So uh, I stressed myself out just a little bit that first time around. So, yeah, just a few nights. But- just just a few so, night sweats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me what your first episode was like. Uh, the first episode was both terrifying and exciting. You know, when. Do you remember what it was about? I don't even remember what it was about. I don't. I <laughs> You've caught me off guard here. And I don't even think if I thought long and hard, I don't even think I can tell you what it was about. I think the the first episode we may have sort of told people what we intended to do. Um, I don't even okay. know if we did that. <laughs> I, I, you know, it was funny because we didn't, you know, when we were starting it, we we're like, oh yeah, and we had all these ideas and all this stuff we wanted to do, and we knew sort of really what sort of what we wanted the show to be like and what we wanted it to be out. We knew what we didn't want to do, um, and who we didn't want to be. And I think that was really helpful, as helpful as knowing who you want to be. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we didn't know podcasting was was really very new back then. We didn't know if one person was going to listen, if 10, per, if, you know, 10 people, ten, yeah. 10 persons. Yeah, I can speak today. And, and then so we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, we didn't. Oh, you know, we thought all kinds of, we thought, oh, we're going to get all this hate mail or, oh, we're going to just crickets and nothing. And so we didn't know what to expect. So it was scary and exciting and fun. And well, we were mostly pleasantly surprised. Seems so. Seems like it. 10 yeah. years. Huh? Ten, ten. 10 years, I think. Yeah. Well, it's a, eight seasons, but I think it's been actually 10 years. Yeah. Tell us why you're leaving in a nutshell. A lot uh, of us kind of have an idea, but. Yeah, I think. The nutshell is I had a bunch of things happen in my life in this last year, and I already had a sense that it was it was time to put the podcast to bed, Um, that in a lot of ways I'd said what needed to be said uh, and talked to the people that I really thought needed to be talked to, with the exception of a very few. Um, But my priorities were changing. You know, my wife, wife and I are looking at starting a family. Um, I'm going back to finish this academic project that I put on hold for the last 20 years. And then I just looked at things and said, you know, I can't, I'm not Superman. Uh, Jonathan used to have a great expression, which was we're all Superman till we're not. That really came into fruition in the last year. It was like, I can't do everything I need to do within my own life for my own family and keep doing the show. Um, and I think that was really it, it, it the simple head on it is time. I just don't have, there's just not enough, not enough, just not enough time in a week to get it all done. Right. Well, I commend you on your life editing because <laughs> we're all struggling with that these days. That is so hard. Um, you know, you and I off air, were just talking about Neil Strauss, my, my former boss and, and friend and stuff. And in, in private moments when he and I were just talking, hanging out and, and goofing around and lamenting about the universe, um, one of the things we kept finding ourselves saying at the end of conversations is the problem with life is it's all so fascinating and I want to do it all and I can't. Um, and I think in a lot of ways that's, that's hard because there are so many things that are interesting. It's, you know, it's just like being in preparedness. There's so many interesting parts of preparedness that you're like, oh, I want to do that. And I want to become an expert on it. And then five seconds later, oh, I want to do that and become an expert on it. And you just can't do everything without right. absolutely making yourself insane. You got to put gas in the car and go there and yes, it adds up. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Bullets in the, well, you got to feed the, feed the baby. Yep. You're going away completely communication that you're saying that you're going to have or. So the, the YouTube thing is, I don't intend to go away completely, but I do also want to be honest in that I don't have a real plan. For what happens next, I have a sense of what I would like to do. I would like to do uh, YouTube videos that are more instructional in nature, a little more like the monologues I've been doing as of late, where I take 10 minutes 
and break down a topic and talk about a topic. And YouTube is more conducive to that. 10 minute podcasts to me are just weird. So I don't see a point in really doing it that way. The other thing is a, a lot of the stuff I would like to do and talk about requires visuals. And well, that's, you can do it in a podcast, but for reasons that are more technical than, than are really interesting in this podcast, doing video based podcasts are very problematic. So it, YouTube just makes more sense there. And what about your plans to return? to podcasting ever kind of as a, as a, as a, as a real presence in the, in the Apple podcast again? Uh, I don't see myself returning to podcasting. Um, I love podcasting. I do want to say that I absolutely love it. And, and while, you know, like, like anybody with anything, you know, there's, there's things that Apple's doing today that I don't like, but, but I love Apple and I love that they supported podcasting before it made any sort of business sense for them to do. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is a real business sense for them to do it. And really, there always has been. But I don't necessarily think maybe they didn't know what it was in the beginning. They just said, let's, this is kind of cool. This is a new medium. This is a new thing. It's more of a democratization of, of voices. Let's support it. Um, and I love them for that. But I don't the the time required to produce a, a good podcast there it, it requires a lot of time and effort so i just don't see myself doing that i may do sort of a thing like what dan carlin does with uh common sense not that i'm putting myself uh in league with dan carlin by any stretch of the imagination at all the man is amazing um but his his show common sense is kind of when he has something to say he feels is worth being heard mm -hmm. he puts out something on that, um, which is different than hardcore history that he puts out, uh, for those yeah. unfamiliar with yeah. it. Um, and well, so I may do something like that because I have no intention of taking the feed down. I'm going to leave those episodes in the feed up indefinitely. There's, there's very minor cost for me to just leave it up. So I'll do that. Um, cause I think there's a tremendous amount of helpful things in the past episodes that, that new people who've not listening to the show today when this airs in the future may, may find helpful. Um, and so from time to time, I may drop in a new episode if something comes up and I'm like, you know what? I got something to say. I think it's worth being heard. Let me make a podcast episode and I may just throw it in for fun. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. But no big, no promises. But that's kind of how I'm looking at podcasting going forward. Cool. Uh, yeah, it would be the updates on your thoughts on life or thoughts on prepping. If you're still in that genre, yeah. that would be awesome. I'm I'm uh, sure I, I have no intention personally to leave preparedness. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, if I do anything else, it'll it'll still probably be in in that. I think I just I have lots of other random interests, but I think if I did anything, I would put something back into the the prepper survivalist community. You've got a lot of information stored in that head, so <laughs> I got a lot of nonsense in there, and then sometimes <laughs> it's mixed in with with a few nuggets. I like to think. Yeah. So a couple of questions from the Armada followers. Mm -hmm. uh, what are a couple of your favorite memories from the podcast? What what just pops to mind first? Uh, you know, I think my favorite memories are the first episode. Mm -hmm. um, that that was one of my favorite. Just like just we were so excited and so scared uh, and just like, what could go wrong? To heck with it. Let's do this thing. It'll be crazy. Had no idea what it was getting myself into. Um, I think other memories are different. Uh, working with both Jonathan and Jason on the show. Um, we had a lot of fun off air. There were a lot of things that were just, just guys sitting around joking, working on a project together, having fun, coming up with crazy ideas that were totally inappropriate. Uh, and coming up with ideas that were good ideas that did need to be episodes. Um, and so those are the best memories. Um, and then there were often the memories of things like, because of the show, the people I got to meet. Um, that was that was a cool thing. Because it is different. When you have a podcast, it doesn't matter that you're nobody. Suddenly it's like, oh, you've got a podcast. Okay, I'll talk to you. 
Uh, and there's a lot of people who normally you couldn't just pick up the phone <laughs> Good and to talk know. to. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of one of the side benefits of, <laughs> oh, well, and now now podcasting is a much more serious thing. And back then it was a little more like, oh, you got a podcast. Oh, you live in your mom's basement. Um, yeah. Now it's taken much more seriously, but it was always a thing of there was a legitimate reason to pick up the phone uh, or Skype or whatever and actually speak to an expert. Like they would, they had a real reason to talk to you. You weren't just some random person or they didn't think you were some random person. Um, and you could actually sit and have a conversation with them for an hour and ask them whatever you wanted to within reason. So I think those were some of the best memories. Yeah. Okay. So from, I believe this was Philip that wanted to know absolute nuggets, any absolute nuggets that you've taken away from the show? You know, I think one of the show, the, the big thing that, one of the big things that I took away from the show was doing the show forced me to put my thoughts down um, sort of on paper, formally. Um, and when you do that, those ideas go from being these nebulous things to more concrete things. And they force you to defend your ideas in a lot of ways, or defend your thoughts and defend, defend your viewpoints. Um, at least I think a thinking person would do that. Sure. Um, and so it has made me, it's made me a much better prepper because it's forced me to stop and think about things. I think the biggest one is, you know, what I recently did, which was just like, don't, don't focus on the improbable at the expense of the probable. Um, and, and that was probably one of the biggest lessons. I think the other thing too is yeah. keeping things simple uh, trying to systematize things. And then the other thing is not, not chasing every new fad, not chasing every new whiz bang gadget. Um, I got a lot of whiz bang gadgets and most of them collect dust. And I would say that it's, it's things like that, that it's, it's, it's paying attention to yourself, your surroundings, what's going on and, and making sure that, that you're getting things done that are, that are level headed, I think is, is, mm -hmm. is the best one that I can put it. I think those are the best nuggets. Cool. So for me, here's a question. Okay. What, how is the guy sitting here today different from the guy who started that first episode and how much did that have to do with podcasting? Um, a lot of it had to do with podcasting. I would say is pretty different. Um, very different views of things. I think I have a much better understanding, uh, a much firmer grasp of what I believe and why I believe it and why I think different things, whether it has to do with the show or not. Um, and that's very different. And then also just, it's been 10 years. So I've had a lot of, a lot of life experiences and a lot of things that happened in my personal life that were not part of the show and never made it into the show. And I never really saw it make sense to, I don't, I don't know. And I, I've caught some grief from from listeners that I don't put enough of my personal life in the show and I just always didn't do it because I was just like who cares like I, I just never thought it was that like I'm just not that interesting um and so those things have held that but I think a lot of that um I think has played a huge role in me being a different person and a different prepper um from a prepper standpoint you know I very different very different you know and and falling prey to the same things that a lot of preppers do, which is chasing every new um, uh, possible crisis and worrying about every, and and often blowing them out of proportion um, and things like that. Now I'm just more like, yeah, all right, that, that thing's going on. That's a possibility, but you know, we stay steady, stay, stay focused. So what did get you into prepping in the first place? That's an interesting question. Um, and a difficult one to answer in that it was so long ago, you know, I think so growing up, I was always big into outdoors and stuff like that. I was, I, mm -hmm. you know, growing up wanted, you know, all I wanted to do was, was, uh, play in the woods. And I think, you know, for, for the longest time, all the, the only thing I wanted to do was be a Marine and do all these other things, um, and play with guns. Uh, and then I got away with, from it for, for a while. Um, and then in my late, or not late, my early, early twenties, the world started to get a little weird. Um, it was already weird, but to me, I started perceiving it as being, things are getting a little, little weird. 
And so was that pr- kind of pre Y two K or post Y two K when you said the world was sort of getting weird? That was that was pre Y two K, and then and then definitely Y two K. I mean, that wrapped a lot of people up. I didn't. I saw Y two K as being something like this could be a problem, but I think I dealt with computers, computer systems enough that I understood. Like mm-hmm. I don't. I didn't feel like it was as big of a thing as people were making it out to be. Thankfully, it was not. Um, I felt a lot of the the bug that people worried about was uh, had largely been resolved. Mm-hmm. Um, but then it became more of a. It was really, and I know this was something that John learned. It was really, I didn't like where the world was going uh, politically. I thought um, I was really starting to become concerned with the encroachment on liberties and the basic principles that uh, the United States was founded on. And I just kept seeing like, it's just mm-hmm. too easy for these people to take away because they feel like they know better. Um, even though they're proven over and over, they don't know better mm-hmm. um, that, that, you know, I know what's best for my own life. And so that government encroachment really started to, to kind of freak me out. And then also the economic thing. And I think those are the two big things. And then it's sort of, you know, the, the 2008 crash sort right. of really fanned the flames for us personally. We were already, as a group, we were already really getting heavy into it. And then the, the economic crash just kind of threw us over the edge. We're like, oh, and we, were, we thought all kinds of crazy things were going to happen that fortunately did not happen. Um, and I think that's one of the things you see with time and preparedness is it's easy to become attached to those big ticket things and think, oh, this is the big one. Here it comes. And it's no, right. It's so, right. Great. This one's from um, uh, Mark. <laughs> As the podcast, uh, wait a minute. Yeah, you always got to be careful with Mark's questions. This was Mark. Has the podcast sent you somewhere unexpected, either literally or figuratively, or gotten you involved in something you never saw coming? I.e., from Mark, I never expected myself to be brewing meat, but here I am. Uh, I never expected myself to enjoy meat or ever be around anybody that made meat. Um, so I think that's one thing. There you uh, go. There you go. Um, meat's neat. I think, uh, I would have never expected myself to have gotten into like raising rabbits and doing all that stuff that we did a, a few years back with the i 2 farm and having chickens. Like I just like, I think if it had been <laughs> eight. Eight years before that, I would have never I've been like, what? I'm going to do what? And I'm going to spend my weekends how? Oh, that's a, what the. And so I, I think those are some of the things that I got into that. I think that's the, the biggest standout one. You know, yeah, we were out that's there gotta be. building cages and scooping poop, I think was what, how we were spending our weekends for a long time. So that was that was definitely different. That, that took me down a different road. Wow. So speaking of the time spent doing random things. What, what do you think you're going to do now with the, all this extra time that you're going to have? <laughs> uh, it's, it is immediately of extra time, right? I'm going to have loads of free time now. <laughs> I, that, so essentially I'm going to spend more time, uh, focused on, uh, an academic pursuit. Um, and more time with my wife, which really, I, I, you know, that's, that's always a smart thing to do. Um, they, they sort of frown on not spending much time with them. Yeah. And, uh, so that, and then also, you know, it's because of, we're, we're working on a family. So I'm sure that kids, when they, when they come along, hopefully if they come along, um, that'll take up some time, you know, and then there's other just personal projects. Like I really need to spend time on, I feel like I need to spend time on my own preparedness for a while. Um, you know, I need to, I've done a lot to really whittle down my pile of prepper shit over the last couple of years. Um, mm-hmm. I have several, uh, what is it? They're, they're like five foot, five feet wide, two feet deep and eight feet tall shelves that are my pile of prepper shit. And that's over it. the, huh? That's it. That's it. And, and that's come down a lot. Um, and I, and that's, I've been trying to pair back things that just like, why do I have this or why do I have 20 of them? Um, and mm-hmm. so some of it I've been giving away, some of it I've, I've put on eBay and a lot of it was just stuff like, I understand why I bought this when I bought it, but now I look at it and I'm like, I don't need that. Or, you know, I have a skill that makes that tool not necessary or whatever. 
So I've really pared it back. And one of my things is I would like to get my own personal stuff down to the point where everything that I would ever possibly leave the house with or need fits in the bed of a pickup truck. And that's it. Uh, I don't want to have more stuff than that. Um, Okay, you definitely need to do a YouTube on that. <laughs> I might. I might do that. Actually, no, I will do that. Um, and so that's something, and I think, it, and something that I've really, and I know I've been beating this horse up lately, um, of really trying to focus on the, the more practical things. And that's something I just mm. want to spend time on my own stuff, simplifying, reevaluating, and thinking about what is preparedness and what am I preparing for and how am I preparing? And does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, are you the painter with the unpainted house? Since you, No, I wouldn't say that. There are some aspects where I, I feel like people probably think I'm doing or have done more than I have. Um, uh, Mark, who we were talking about earlier, uh, and a few other people, we have a running joke that I have all my hand loading and reloading stuff sitting on a shelf here waiting to go right. into use. And I just, that project has been on hold for like a year because I just don't have the time to get it, to do the final steps needed to get everything set up so that I can then start cranking it out. Um, but for the most part, I mean, most of the, I would say most of the things stay very well organized and on their schedule and do all that stuff. I just need to pare back. Well, cool. That sounds like, um, something that you could really keep everybody updated on because I think everybody can use that advice about paring down and always, always reevaluating yeah. your stuff, not yeah. just prepping stuff, but just stuff in general. That's a great. Yeah. And I think that. one other project that, and I don't think I, I haven't ever talked about this before, certainly not publicly, but you know, I'm in my early forties and you know, we're just now starting to work on having kids and, and that plays a big role in my life. You know, I look at like, oh my God, when my kid's my age, I'm going to be in my eighties. Like, um, <laughs> and so having that different perspective and having all of the equipment and all the other stuff already set up, you know, I think, I think about things like, oh, okay, well, our family is very small. Um, there there's, and, and somehow it just keeps getting smaller and there's a lot of history being lost. Um, and there was already because of events, you know, Germany, um, there was a lot of our family history that was already lost. I I've been jokingly titling it a series just for my kids. That's shit. I may have forgotten to tell you. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be a video <laughs> series that walks them through. And it basically is going to say on there, like, don't open this until I'm dead. Um, and you know, I think the first video we'll start out with is this is what it's going to be like when you lose your dad. Here's what to expect. Here's what life is going to be like. Here's some things you're going to think about. It's all okay. Just here's what to expect and how to get through it. Um, and then a series of just like life lessons and things I've learned and things I thought when I was 20 that I'm like, now that I'm 40 or even things when I was 15 yeah. that I thought now I'd be like, Oh my God, what the hell? Um, <laughs> you know, and just, just dad it. And and also mix in with, you know, in case it never came up or in case I forgot to tell you, here's the story of your family, at least this side of your family. Um, and and you know, the different people you may have never heard about and the things they did and why they were interesting. And one of them even has a, a lot of historical significance and understanding that person who also was a very hard person to understand to begin with. Um and and so really sharing that. So that's sort of a I guess a very personal project that I'm going to be working on for probably, I hope to be working on it for a long time, but it, it, I'll start working on it here pretty soon. That is such a cool idea. I think mm. everybody should do that if they could in any capacity, but um, if you do it well, what a gift. I mean, that would just yeah. be. Yeah. And I think one of the things I've been thinking about, and it was one of the the very last things I actually said to my dad, which was, you know, there were a lot of lessons you taught. And I know at the time, you didn't think I was listening and and you were right because I was I was too young to hear them. I was like, but I have remembered them or at least most of them. And yeah. I do know what you were trying to tell me and I get it now. Yeah. Um, like literally that was the last thing that I said to the man. Um, wow. And so I think that's another part of it is I want to make sure that those things are around so that if, you know, so that 
my kids can listen to them in time and in context and with the right, you know, maybe re-listen to them and go, oh, wait, yeah, all right, dad was right. Um, you know, the yeah. old joke, the older you get, the smarter your dad gets and, and your mom too. Um, and that is so true. Like I look at it now, I'm like, I was an idiot. My dad knew what he was talking about the whole time. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Very true. Very mm. true. And, and I mean, you can do it on a prepper level to mentor new, new preppers or mm -hmm. really changing preppers. I mean, how would you say the landscape has changed in the prepping world in this last decade that you've been in it? That is a fantastic question. It has, it's, some of it has not changed at all. Uh, some things have changed quite a bit. Um, the things that have changed, this is not new. This is a cycle. But, you know, when I first really started getting serious about preparedness, uh, I guess it's been about 16 years now. Mm -hmm. It um, Prepping was just kind of starting to see a resurgence. And it still had a lot of that 1980s survivalist kind of run off to the woods feel Red to Dawn. it. Yeah. And then, you know, yeah, Red Dawn. Um, and then it started to change a little bit and you saw a lot of people come in, but you saw people and it's just, this is the cycle. People come in because they get one thing freaks them out. You know, first it was Y2K, then it was 2008, um, then it was Obama. And, and now we're seeing the same thing with Trump, just with a different group of people. And mm -hmm. there's a cycle. And I think one thing, and it's a little disconcerting to me now that I do see is where it's sort of like a, a, a tide coming and going. And there's a lot of people I see. And when I talk to a lot of, a lot of other people in the preparedness community uh, that are content creators or that are products and selling products and stuff like that the the tide has sort of gone back out and we're at low tide again where a lot of people because they think their guy got in office or because they're burnt out or whatever the reason but a lot there's been a large outflux of people from preparedness mm. and i imagine within the next couple of years we'll see them rush right back in again along with a new crop but um it's changed in that way there's a lot more and i hate to paint it this way because it doesn't do it justice but for ease of use, you know, if we just say there's the left and there's the right, which there's not, it's a huge spectrum. Um, and I don't fit into either camp, really. Um, but we see a lot more people from the left flowing into preparedness right now. Oh, um, really? Yeah, a lot more. And it's funny because if I talk to other people in the industry, they're like, oh, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm just seeing the tide out. And, and I think a lot of it is just like what... M m you know, I there they don't in the same way that I got started because I didn't think the community, the voices in the community rep really represented me. I mean, same thing that Donald felt the same way. Um, I don't think those people feel like there's any voices, so they're not glomming on to the rabbit hole or whatever else, um, and they're being turned off by it. So they're just not visible to most of us that have been around for a long time. We're like, oh, there's there's nobody here, and it's like, no. There are a lot more people here than we think. They're just not interacting with us. And that's fine. You know, hopefully mm -hmm. that'll branch some new show or something that that they do that does speak to their needs the same way the rabbit hole started because we just thought this doesn't speak to us. So Right. Burning question. Oh, are they are these leftists this influx of leftist preppers, are they pro gun ownership? Have you seen that? Uh, I haven't, I'll be honest. I haven't paid a lot of attention to it. Um, just like I don't really pay attention to the right or left. I've, I've just always kind of been like, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to talk about what I want to do. Right. Talk about, um, because that being a cornerstone of the prep, I was just curious if you'd seen a trend there, it would be interesting. I, I know people who have tried to go into those groups and say, I'm not trying to convince you politically or philosophically, but you obviously need some help. You're going off in crazy directions. Let me offer you some advice by somebody who's been at this a long time. Um, the the What I hear is a lot of those people really wrestle with gun ownership. They mm -hmm. both want one because now they think some boogeyman's coming for them. Um, mm -hmm. And then they don't want one. So I think they're having, a, some of those people are having a very hard time rectifying that. And then I also have heard stuff where it's like, oh, well, guns are bad. But 
these other things are good. And it's like, well, the outcome's the same. Like you're still, you're still going to do harm to another person. Like it's just a tool. And I don't think that's registered. So I don't know that I could really, I don't know. I don't feel like I could really speak to that question very well, but that's the little bit of what I do know about the, that more left leaning side of preparedness. Interesting. It's an interesting conversation to start and to have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but sorry for the rabbit trail. I just had to ask oh, because that was news to me. Yeah. So anyway, um, so what about as you wrap this up um, and looking back, what's your advice to new podcasters or aspiring podcasters in today's climate? I know you talked about the mm. climate back when you started being kind of the garage uh, startup, you know, <laughs> guy in the garage culture or whatever. But, right, right. Yeah, but, I think there were a lot of, yeah, there was a different, a different view. It was like, oh, you know, most people were like, what's a podcast? Uh, back then, and then the few people who knew what, what it were, what it was, were like, "Oh yeah, you got a podcast. Why don't you go get a right. real radio show?" Uh, you know, and you radio, even, yeah, radio. radio, yeah. You've got uh, you know dinosaurs like Howard Stern, like oh, podcasting in your mom's basement, which was a big funny thing he did one time. I laughed. I was like, That's "Oh really?" Girl. And some of what yeah. he said was totally accurate, but a lot of it was you know, and and I, he was revving up the audience, uh, yeah. but. But now podcasting has become such a big thing. Um, yeah. And I think that's overwhelming. And I hear people all the time like, oh, my God, it's it's the field is too flooded. You're, you're just not going to get anywhere anymore. And it's like the time to get in was yesterday, but today's still good, too. Um, and I would yeah. just say the advice is know what you want to, to be, what you want to talk about before you get started. Um, one of the, like, I guess the very practical bits of advice as I always give is make six episodes. Uh, if you can make eight, even better. And try to stick to a schedule, the schedule that you think is going to be your release schedule and make those eight shows, uh, six to eight shows. And at the end of it, if you still want to make a podcast, you're, you're probably golden. Um, but if you make those six to eight shows, you will learn real fast, like a, how much of a time requirement it is, B, how hard it is to make a good show. Um, and you'll get a real sense of what it actually takes. When we got started, we didn't know there was no advice. There was nothing. It was just like, here's garage band, the, the software and go buy some microphones. And you're talking to a guy at guitar center. Who's like, so you guys are like in a band and you're like, no, we're going to make a podcast podcast. What's that, man? Um, <laughs> And you just be like, radio, radio style. My ah, radio. Okay. These microphones. I don't know why I'm talking like the bus driver from the Simpsons, but, <laughs> uh, but anyway, and so, you know, there's a lot more information out there now, but when we got started, it was just like, you're just flying by the seat of the pants and you had no idea what to expect. Um, but I would say very much like, know who you are, know what you're about. Um, and, and it's not too late to get into it and don't listen to anybody that it doesn't matter what the medium is when people say, Oh, it's too late. That's, that's dead. Or that's, you're not going to make it just do it. If you like it and you want to talk about it, you know, yeah. don't, don't have illusions that you're going to become famous or anything, but just do it to do it. It's fun. Um, yeah. it, and after six episodes, you'll know if you think it's fun or not. Um, but, but I would say that that's good because a lot of podcasts, uh, do die. The reason I say sex is, a lot of podcasts die after six episodes because it takes about that long for people to go, oh, this is a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Are you glad you did it? And any regrets? I am very glad I did it. I had a lot of fun making the show. I mean, it was a lot of work, but I had a blast making the show. And like I said, I got to talk to some amazing people and it forced me to really be much more concise with my thoughts and, and ideas and philosophies. Uh, the regrets I have would be um, taking different comments from people more personally than they should have been. Um, there was one, oh my God, this one was hysterical and it actually did change the show. Um <laughs> Somebody compared listening to the show to watching old people eat oatmeal. And I was pissed about that for like four 
weeks. Oh, I was just, I was on fire. I was like, screw that guy. He didn't know what I do for this show. And ah, and I spent all this time. And then he's like, you sound like old people watching oatmeal. And, but. That's a creative insult. It was, yeah. And it was, it took me about four weeks to cool off. <laughs> And after about four weeks, I sat back and I thought, okay, okay, okay. The person obviously put some thought into being an insulting ass, but it is a wrong. And so I sat and I thought about it and I, I listened to a couple other, I sat and listened to a, a few other radio personalities who I find entertaining and I like their presence and the way they perform. And then I went and listened to the rabbit hole and I went, mm-hmm. I could do that better. He's not wrong. I could do that better. Mm-hmm. And there was a, dis- there is a, dis- a time when the show starts, there's a distinctive change where I am trying to put more life into the show because it is easy to get in front of a microphone and become monotone. Yeah. Uh, and I tried to get rid of that. I worked really hard to try to get rid of that. And it's still, I wrestle with a little bit because it's so easy to just be like, and then, and it's difficult to, uh, put the enthusiasm that you have for a topic into words sometimes, uh, or, or to emote, I guess is the right word. So, uh, the regret I would say is that I spent too much time worrying about the technical and things like the audio quality and not enough time worrying about the presentation or the content itself. Uh, mm-hmm. for a very long time, I spent way too much time and money trying to figure out about microphones and gadgets and all this other stuff and that's not what's important in making a show um and uh as far as other the regrets i don't know i don't think i really have any other regrets i i i I, i'm i'm proud of what what jonathan and jason and i all made and then i'm proud of what i made uh when they had to when life took over for them um and you know i'm i'm glad i did it i'm i'm really glad i did it that's awesome. Well, thank you. I just want to say thank you. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of all the listeners for the value you've provided for the time and the conversations and the thought that you've put into it. Because I mean, just personally, I, I can speak for a ton of value that I've been able to glean from the show, all the thought you put into it and consideration and an organization of thought, which is huge. Mm-hmm. And the connections that I've made through it. Mm-hmm. Um, have been awesome. So it's 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 a very fruitful thing that you've done, and we're out there and pour yourself out and all your interest in this area to to uh, benefit us. And I, and I know that you know it hasn't been like you know money rolling in for off the off the <laughs> <laughs> yeah off the off the rafters, but it's been um, sounds like it's been worthwhile for you, and it's been wonderful for everybody that got to be a part of it. So thanks. It. Um... I really appreciate that. And I don't, I, I don't, I'm not saying this for me, but I am saying this for people. If you listen to a podcast, let that podcaster know you, you enjoy what they do. Um, even if it's just a simple, thank you. I think a lot of people think podcasters don't pay attention, but for a lot of podcasters and YouTube is a little bit different because there's a huge social aspect to YouTube, but for a lot of podcasters, they sit in a bubble and they have no idea. They, they see numbers tick by and they're like, oh, I, don't, I don't know. Is anybody really paying attention? Does anybody care? Um, but thank you for the, thank you. I, that, that, you know, and I, when I would get things like that from people, um, minus the oatmeal comments, um, <laughs> it made it, it made it worthwhile to do like, okay, yeah, I'm doing something here. I'm doing something helpful, uh, and putting something good out in the world. Well, wonderful. And good luck with everything in the future. Thank you. Show notes, links, and other tasty resources from this episode can be found by going to in the rabbithole.com slash E300. If you're watching this on YouTube, just look in the description section below this video. And speaking of YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to do all that YouTube stuff. Throw us a like, subscribe, and slap that bell around because bananas are yellow. With that, we wrap up episode number 300 from the Lone Star State. Till next time, stay safe, pencil!